Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And our colleague, Joy J. Moore, is on vacation, and she will rejoin us soon, we hope. The texts for September 20th, 2020, a lot of 20s there, Jonah 3, 10 through 4, 11, the semi-continuous Old Testament, Exodus 16, 2 through 15, the psalm is Psalm 145, 1 through 8. The second reading is Philippians 1, 21 through 30. And the gospel reading is Matthew 21 through 16. It's a great parable, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> what do you think it's about, Matt? Oh, I think it's about the scandalous nature of divine grace. I, I think this parable and the parables in Luke 15 are probably the most offensive of all the parables um, to our own sense of like kind of fairness, you get what you earn, so on and so forth. This is about a, uh, th this is about freely given uh, grace. This is about uh, a way of describing what justice looks like from the perspective of Jesus. The, the workers are promised to be paid whatever is right, whatever is the chaos, whatever is just. And then that all gets, that all gets upturned at the very end of the parable. Uh, and the response of those who have toiled all day is, is, is not so much, this is unfair, but it's, you have made them equal to us. It's just an interesting line that you have given dignity to those that we think don't deserve it, or you have given an equal share or full privileges to those who uh, don't measure up in, in our perspective. And that's an important lesson, I think, in any age. I think one of the uh, I, one of the keys of this parable is to to really go back as we're as we're coming toward the end of of Matthew or moving into these final chapters of Matthew, um, and particularly um, in this case, you know, twenty one is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and so uh, so so to what extent Jesus uh, Jesus is still in this public sort of character of ministry. Uh, I think it's really interesting then that this parable is located here uh, in that uh, it, it is a call back to the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount um, in terms of what is good or what is just or what is righteous is, has been the lens through which this entire gospel has called us to, uh, to imagine that perspective of, of are you one, are you one, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness or not. And so this puts a spin on that, that, uh, it, that I, think is, I think is important for people to think about is that um, it, is our righteousness or is our justness uh, through the perspective of God or through the perspective of, of conventional society and, so the, and conventional structures, hierarchical structures. And so it's a, I think it's a really interesting, it's a, it's, yeah, sure, it's an offensive parable, but it's a way in which to, you know, like, call attention to uh, that, that absolute, uh, that absolute mark of what this kingdom of heaven looks like. And, uh, and it's, and it, it upends all of those expectations and forces you to imagine the kind of, of righteousness and justness that does not uh, that does not equate or does not uh, connect with how we we think of fairness and justness and righteousness. So I think to I think for the preacher to go back to uh, the Beatitudes would be a helpful lens through which to um, put this in perspective. Yeah, I agree. That's a great place. I think for any parts of Matthew, especially those that are coming up, or someone more difficult, right? Keep going back to what's holding this gospel together. I think, too, if I were preaching on this this Sunday, I would settle into verse 10 and keep asking that question, or asking the question, why did these workers think they would receive more? Right? You imagine them waiting in line, seeing others who have been paid the same amount they were, they were promised. 
even though they've worked fewer hours and their expectation is they're going to get paid more. And just to ask that question, right? We're not told why they expect to get paid more, but just to play with that for a little bit and to wonder what those rules are, or those kind of unwritten expectations that govern whether it's the, the value of work or the value of people. Um, I don't know, I would, I would start my sermon, sermon building around that question. It's, I've never been particularly offended by this parable, but I know other people who are, and there's one church where this one member would just be so angry when this was read, uh, would, would, so, would get prepared to be angry for it, um, and then would stew. Um, if, you've, if you understand how much you don't deserve grace and the incredible gift it is, and that you are overwhelmed with gratitude for the grace you're given, that another should also be given it isn't offensive. It's the very nature of grace. But if you still have some sort of um, what, what uh, Lutherans in their book of confessions would be called the opinio legis, that is just sort of like just, just the, the, the way the world works way of thinking, um, if you lay, if you're syncretizing that or overlaying that on top of uh, the, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, yeah, I can see where you get offensive. I do want to say uh, to the to the cry, it's not fair. My all, all these years, my response to my kids, it's not fair. They never say that because my response was always, the fair is in August. It's where they judge pigs. Can't say that this year because the fair, which should be going on right now, as we're recording this the fair has been called off. So I can't say it. So I have, to, I need a new line. The fair used to be in August. There you go. Or maybe it will come back in 21 or 22. Something like I that. I hope That's so. Good, good Lord, I hope so. I'm not a big fan of the fair. I, I think too that in preaching this, you have to help people understand what's going on in verse seven when the people who are still in the marketplace at the end of the day are asked, why have you not been working? And their response is because no one has hired us. It's, yeah. It is not because these are, are lazy people. These are people who can't get jobs. Yeah. And so again, to explore with people who can't get hired until the end of the day. My weak people, the elderly, uh, uh, disabled, um, uh, former, you know, released felons, people who have been, who no longer have been able to regain trust in their society or are ruled out of certain jobs. I mean, these kinds of things. Uh, and just to ask that question, right? Who doesn't get hired in a society, although they appear to have been you know, doing what they need to do to try to get employed. And that's where the grace flows in the most um, generous way, at least in this parable. You know what's an even more offensive parable about God's grace? The entire book of Jonah, which is uh, the <laughs> thematic Old Testament lesson chosen uh, very well, actually, to partner with this, because Jonah is a parable um, to, the, to the eternal question, was Jonah really alive in the belly of the whale, my dad used to say. My dad's a retired pastor. He used to say, that's the most believable part of this book. And the idea that the king of Nineveh, right, the Assyrian emperor, uh, would uh, repent and appeal to Yahweh's mercy is sort of, a, sort of um, an extreme parable. And you get this story, right? And at the beginning of it, again, you probably have to, if you're gonna preach on Jonah, you have to preach the whole book, but why not? It's such a great story. Friend of mine, uh, we just did a week of Bible studies together, and a friend of mine, this is, you know, it, the book, book of Jonah is his life book. It tells his story about being in the belly of the whale. But you have to tell the story that God calls Jonah to preach forgiveness to Nineveh. Instead of heading east towards Nineveh, he heads west because he want, he disobeys God. And en route, he converts an entire uh, boatload, shipload of um, Gentiles, then the belly, the whale spits him out on the shore of Nineveh. He preaches the worst sermon in the history of preaching. Caroline, when you teach preaching, 40 days and Nineveh shall be no more. That's his sermon. 
That's a really bad sermon. And I the do, whole city repents. I do use that as an example. Do you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that e the Lord can use even a bad sermon? No, yes. that's not you. <laughs> okay, good. But th then Jonah finally says why he's angry, why he fled. And it's because he knows the Lord's character. We had this verse last week. It's here and it's in Psalm 145 that goes with this passage. I knew that you are a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger, binding steadfast love and ready to relent from punishment. And I don't want the Ninevites to have grace, right? I mean, that's the parable. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and the book ends, but shouldn't I love those people and their animals? That's what mm -hmm. the Lord says. Well, and I, I think too, the line that I, I was thinking about a lot is for one, but this was very displeasing to Jonah, this, this character of God and he became angry and uh and that and just just that that contrast of god being slow to anger and yet and yet jonah being angry uh in terms of you know what is it what is it what is it that angers him and i think that could be something that um what 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 makes us angry in these uh, in these situations where uh, we want God to do what we want God to do, or in the situation of the parable where, where there's just um, mass equality and unity rather than division. Um, what is it, what is it that anger, what is, what is it that, what is it the heart of that anger? Uh, and I think that would be something to explore in a sermon of what, what is it named, what is it exactly that we're angry about that really gets us, that really you know, grabs us and say, wait a minute, this isn't right. This isn't fair. Yeah. And the, this that displeased Jonah or made him angry, the, this is that God relented. It says in the previous verse, mm -hmm. God, God relented of the disaster, the evil. And, and that word is the same in Hebrew. Um, so the disaster, God relented of the disaster. That is the same word to displease. Mm. So the fact that God showed mercy displeased Jonah. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. And by the way, if you want to know what the Israelites thought of Nineveh, read Nahum chapter two. And then that, that's, the, that's the kind of, that's the word that Jonah wanted from the Lord. Jonah wanted Nahum, uh, which is funny because the word Nahum means mercy, which is exactly what God does in the, the exact same verb in Jonah 3. So it's, that's the kind of God we want to punish our enemies. And the one we get is a God of mercy. As, as one of my seminary students said, put that in your juice box and suck it. She said that. That's God's message, Jonah. Oh, but I love Exodus 16, the semi-continuous. It just sings to me. Why? Well, I named my band after this verse, for one. Oh, yes. True. That is, um, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill, right? If only we had died. But I, I, And the reason I named it is this is human nature. They've just been saved. We just had the Passover two weeks ago. We just had the Exodus a week ago. And now we're out in the wilderness. We've just been saved by the mighty and glorious wonders of the Lord. And immediately we give up faith. We show no faith. We forget so easy God's grace and mercy and powerful acts in our part. And then we want to go back. Better the enslavement that I know than the freedom that I don't know and how scary freedom and trust in God is. I think, I think that is a, a great point, Rolf, is that to, to imagine or explore why, why is it that, that, that we prefer that than live in, live in freedom and live in, the, live in that true knowledge of God's um, grace and, and mercy uh, and liberation. And what is it that, um, 
yeah, what is it that what is it that we resist about that, or what is it that we um, what is it that scares us about that, or why don't why don't we want that? I think uh, I think that would be worth oh, some exploration in a sermon. I think one thought I have about that, and I'm interested in what you think about it, Matt, is that being freed and trusting God requires a new identity. And it's always hard to give up one's identity, even if one's identity sucks. Um, when I had cancer in high school and then into college, that was my identity. Um, fighting cancer, this is what I get up and do every day and um, live with that. And then finally, when the doctors, sort of out of the blue to me, said, yeah, our statistics show you don't have cancer anymore. It was like, oh, what's my identity? And even though that identity sucks, it's still your identity. And you have to wait a while for that new one to get hold. And so you want to go back. One of, uh, one of our students a number of years ago uh, told me she had grown up with a stepdad who was abusive. And when the stepdad left, uh, she said, my identity sucked but it was the only identity I had, and I didn't know who I was now that my abuser was gone. Yeah, I think you put it really well. <clears throat> that freedom isn't just the absence of, uh, you know, oppression or servitude of some kind. That yeah, freedom does mean taking on a new identity. Freedom's a great feeling, but it's, it's um, yeah. I'll vouch for that, that it is scary to take on a new sense of uh, who am I, how am I defined, how am I seen by others? And that's, um, yeah, that's certainly part of it, which I think is why, and it's, it's helpful, again, we keep talking about Michael Chan's commentaries because they're, he's doing a run of four of them and they're, and they're just so good. But he is talking about how this is not just the stress of desert living, and people should know Michael Chan is actually somebody who knows how to survive in a desert, like he goes out in the deserts of Arizona for fun and, and hunt stuff and knows how to, you know, find sources of sustenance in a desert. Um, but talks about the ways in which the struggle here is believing that God's promises are true, believing that God's sustenance can even take place out here. But he also talks about the ways in which we are still in this, in this period in the narrative of their own movement, again, from, from slavery to freedom, but also to be now formed as a nation, which will happen in Exodus chapter 20, correct? That the, the, the giving of the law there is part of their taking on a new identity. And this is a, a, a period of not just wandering, but of learning, what we would call formation in some way, shape or form. And, and maybe we should take some comfort in the fact that it doesn't come easy for them or that it takes time. I don't think this is God leading them on some kind of a trial. Like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to beat the sense of servitude out of you, but it's, this is the journey, right? You're going to have to learn. It's going to take a while, uh, but eventually they're going to become made into a new nation, a new people with, with new information about this God who has liberated them. That is supposed to be life giving as well. In that sense, this is a great leadership passage for congregations. Um, if God is leading your congregation into a new, a new identity with a new set of practices, because the set of practices your congregation learned in Christendom aren't working as well as they used to work, uh, and you're not fulfilling God's mission as much as you'd like to in the neighborhood in which you're planted, it's leading them into that new set of behaviors and following God's leadership uh, it's just, we just want to go back. And so if your people are going resisting and you thought you had an agreement, and then you come back to the council, the next meeting or the committee the next time and people are back in those old behaviors again, it's human nature. And it takes that vision out in front and it takes time uh, to live into that. It's a good yeah. message for COVID time too. Yeah. Where people are yearning to go back to the way things were and the way things were, were in many ways, well, they are in many ways no longer achievable, at least not in the near future, but they're also death dealing in a lot of ways in the wider culture. Sorry, Caroline, we both started there at the same time. No, I, I, that's, that's what I was gonna say. Um, oh. I think, 
Um, I think that this passage and what we've just talked about will really, um, again, it's an opportunity for the preacher to, uh, to think about the ways in which, um, you know, Michael has a beautiful line in this commentary, when they groan under the crushing weight of the world, that groan reaches the throne of God. Uh, and, and there's a lot of that kind of groaning um, that's happening, both with, uh, with COVID and, um, and with, uh, with racial injustice. And so um, that, that, is a, that is about living into a new kind of identity and to a new kind of world. And uh, and yet the you know the the promise here is that God hears that so I yeah I think that'd be uh, worthwhile to um, to preach on yeah and we should emphasize the end of the chapter too that God provides the manna yeah I mean that is uh, and that's first of all it's a great thing right because uh, I I always think of uh, myself as a kid or my kids when they were young. In, in this verse when it says, you know, uh, when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what, what, is, what is that? Or what is it? And what is it in Hebrew is mana. And I remember <laughs> putting food in front of my son once when he was little, and he looked at it and said, that's yuck. <laughs> He'd never tasted it, but it just looked, that's yuck. And so that's like, yeah, okay, that's what we're gonna call it. We're gonna call it, that's yuck. And that's its name. Um, a, a, a former colleague of ours who went through a very difficult time in her life and was sustained by the grace of the church around her, but that didn't make it less difficult. I asked her once how she was doing in the midst of it. And she said, well, the Lord's given me manna. And I wake up and the Lord's giving me manna and I'm sick of manna, but it's mm -hmm. still manna, you know, I mean, cause you know, that is, Mm -hmm. the Lord provides and the Lord's provision sustains us, but even that we grow weary of, and that's the next chapter when they get sick of it. But um, it, to, to me, it's a great way of how she was able to narrate using the Bible, her experience of grace. Mm -hmm. A word Psalm on Psalm 145. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say Psalm 145 has a familiar refrain. If you've been <laughs> doing the Psalms this summer. Or, at least or this month, or with us the last two weeks. Psalm yeah. 145, a song of praise, is an acrostic psalm, uh, and so so it doesn't stick together uh, in the same way that you might expect the, the form. But so you know, uh, basically, sort of uh, A is for apple, B is for butterfly. These uh, A, I will extol you. B, every day, and then uh, it's just these great lines of praise, uh, highlighting as Matt was saying, verse eight. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That Exodus 34 creed-like uh, sentence. Well, earlier, Caroline, you talked about going back to the Beatitudes to help us with Matthew. I mean, this is as well, this refrain about the Lord being gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love is a great refrain to keep going with as Matthew's going to get harder and harder <laughs> in forthcoming weeks uh, with more more parables that have some unpleasant endings, shall we say. And so to keep insisting that Matthew sit in the same Bible as these other statements about God's mercy will be an important task for congregations and for their preachers. Uh, we move into uh, four in a row of Philippians uh, that carries us through. And uh, this, this, opening section is certainly um, an important section. I guess if I were going to take on Philippians, what? what say it, to? preach it. I know what you're going to say. I would add. Verses would... 1 through 19, verses 1 through 20. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was <laughs> or the just, same preach thing. On, uh, just preach on those. And I, um, and because I just, you know, this is, this is one of, of course, you know, the, you could give people a little bit of background about Philippians in terms of the, the tone and the nature of the, of the letter and why Paul is writing to them. And it's, you know, a letter of friendship and all of those kinds of things. But it, the words, um, particularly in verse uh, three and four word, uh, in verse six, I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion 
by the day of Jesus Christ. I, that just uh, really resonates with me now. And I think uh, the way in which um, the way in which a preacher could take this letter and uh, and for people to hear it as you know, a, a, as a letter of promise and a letter of gratitude for them. I mean, gratitude for themselves, you know, that here's Paul giving thanks to a, a, a community who, uh, which he knows very well, but giving thanks for their faithfulness in the gospel. gospel. And I, I wonder if there's a way a preacher could uh, capitalize on that tone or really preach that tone and say, uh, I give, we give, I give thanks or God gives thanks for you, uh, for your faithfulness in the gospel, which has been really, really hard the last six months. And, and it's not getting easier anytime soon. And so the way in which you don't just preach about Philippians, but actually preach what it does, uh, would be my, would be my suggestion. That's really great. I think especially to help people get a sense for the, the importance of their own, well, their own selves, but their own bodies in the midst of all of this. So if you're going to add verses, I would say at least verse 20. I mean, that Paul's talking about what does it mean to, to, uh, to exalt Christ in his own body, that Paul sees his body as a locus or as a place or as a source for exalting Christ, even while imprisoned. And Paul will see his body as a place for doing that, even if Paul ends up being killed as a result of his imprisonment. And he's asking the Philippians, who live in a relatively small city, to do a similar thing with their body, right? To live out or to conduct their lives, live their lives, literally live their political lives or conduct their political selves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And in the same way, their bodies will be places where Christ is exalted in all of the ways that they stick out like sore thumbs in this community. I, uh, I want people to add those verses so that they remember that Philippians is a letter from Paul and Timothy to an actual people that some, I think that the, the overwhelming just sense people have of the Bible as a book of doctrine or, or a book of correct behavior um, always needs to be, you know, corrected to have a bigger view. And so that um, you understand that Paul is, living in an actual place and time, addressing people with actual temporal political problems. Um, and I have a question for you, Matt, about prison. What was prison like? What do we know? First of all, we don't know where Paul's in prison, right, when he's writing this, but if you had to guess, where was that? And what was prison life like? Do we know? <laughs> uh, we know a lot. I, how much time you got? We've, I got all day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't know exactly where Paul is imprisoned. Uh, Rome is one of the leading um, candidates, uh, own people who have theorized about that for this letter. Uh, there weren't, there were very few prison buildings the way we think of them today, there to speak about imprisonment. Uh, some people who were poor were thrown into pits uh, or were in a basement of a building and it was pretty much uh, dog eat dog in those places. Somebody like Paul probably was under house arrest uh, of some kind, which makes it sound a little bit better, but you know, you, if you will die in prison unless you have friends or family who can bring you food and clothing. Uh, you will not, you're not supposed to be kept in prison for long. It's not used as a punishment the way we've used it in, in Western society. Uh, but prison was supposed to be kind of a holding tank until somebody could appear and, and defend themselves uh, before charges. So Paul is probably in some kind of government building or house arrest, but he's got help. I mean, one of the, the things behind this letter is uh, they've sent Epaphroditus from Philippi to help care for Paul in his needs, which is a gesture on their part saying, you know, how will Paul survive if he doesn't have source, a source of, of food or support and connection to the outside world? Does that help? Totally. Uh, it, it's no picnic, but somebody, again, with Paul's level of, of status is probably doing better than, than most people. I would, I would be dead within probably 12 hours in a, in a Roman prison site. I, I mean, if I would commend people to preach on this for four weeks, uh, 
And that gives us some context to start with, you know, because uh, we're getting to in the next week some of the really you know, heavy passages. And um, I think in our context, our social context, uh, this letter uh, would speak pretty strongly.